good evening to everyone watching from home online uh, on the streaming service. Uh, welcome to the 14th edition of the Emirates Airline Festival of Literature. Um, what we're doing tonight is we're going to have a discussion about the greatest discoveries and inventions in science, and we've got a fantastic panel uh, to chat about that. Um, I'm Rowan Hooper. I've just written a book called How to Spend a Trillion Dollars, and I've been here talking about that. Uh, I'm also a science journalist at New Scientist magazine in London uh, and the host of the New Scientist Weekly podcast, where basically we chat about science every week, so this is basically what I do as well. So it's all going to be very uh, informal, good chat. Um, so look, let's go around the panel um, and introduce everyone. Sitting next to me here, we've got Ahmed Al Gandour. He's a YouTube star from Egypt. Um, your YouTube channel, remind me what it's called again? Dahi. Uh, Dahi. Yeah. Um, it's, it combines science with comedy, uh, and it's a massive, it's, it's the biggest YouTube um, science channel in the Arab world, basically. Uh, let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> Next to Ahmed, we've got Salem Al Mari. He is chief of the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center here in Dubai. Uh, and he basically has a, a key role in running the astronaut training program of UAE uh, and the Emirates Mars mission. Um, so please give Salem a big round of applause. Thank you. And at the end here, we have Serhei Plohi. He's professor of history at Harvard University, a leading authority on Eastern Europe, and the author of Nuclear Folly Chernobyl, History of a Tragedy, and many other books. Um, and so we're all going to be uh, talking about various different things. Let's give Serhei a round of applause as well. <laughs> so as I say, we're going to be talking about um, inventions that change the world. I, I, I'm going to save mine till the end, and I've noticed that I think that we're not going to talk about much biology, so I'm going to save some of that to the end. But <laughs> Ahmed, what would you kick us off with? Um, so I think... Um, the, again, there's a whole debate about uh, whether mathematics itself is an invention or is it something that's discovered. Uh, but I would say um, that the greatest discovery, and I think it's actually, um, uh, um, or actually the greatest invention, and I think actually it's an invention, is the number zero. It was the moment that we actually decided that we would have a concept for nothingness. Now again, thinking about zero, it's, it's, it's actually very weird because um, we started with counting, and counting, you know, like you'd say, you have two cows, three cucumbers, five apples, or you have no, you just don't have them. So uh, how this number got introduced is of mystery to me. Uh, again, it's interesting to note that uh, numbers themselves actually are an invention. Uh, a lot of societies uh, wouldn't count uh, beyond the number three, so it was uh, one, two, and probably many. Yeah, that's all what we have. Uh, it's interesting to note, uh, I was reading a Charles Safe book, and he was uh, speaking about uh, in the, um, the, uh, the Egyptian book, uh, I think, of the deceased, I don't remember the name of the book, uh, but uh, he would have a criteria for the people who would be on the boat, and it is that they, can, that they could count their fingers. That was, you know, the CFA of the time, that you can do uh, some very hard mathematics of counting the fingers. So again, yeah, counting is something that we recently have. Now, the concept of zero, the concept of nothingness. I find it brilliant that we have decided to name nothingness and that this process and this invention turned out to be of great benefit to society. Now, of course, it started out as a, a digit, so uh, we didn't treat zero as, as something of itself. It was basically a digit that would help us uh, differentiate between 660 and 600. That's one of the reasons it was uh, put forward by the Babylonians. But um, over time, it started to be crucial and important. Uh, now, it's present in multiple fields. Uh, the most famous, of course, is uh, its presence in binary and its effect on uh, you know, doing electronics and programming, computer science, the idea that you can have an on and you can have an off. That's brilliant. Uh, it's also very important in calculus. So it's interesting to note that um, in mathematics, we deal with ideal forms. So it's a circle, it's a triangle, it's a rectangle, and that's it. That's how we calculate its areas, its volumes. But the, the, the invention of calculus uh, 
start saying, okay, we have these irregular shapes. How can we calculate the areas? And there were some brilliant mathematicians who started thinking, okay, maybe this curve that I can't uh, have a name in it in mathematics, uh, I can put multiple squares. And I would do the sum of these squares as, um, as it goes to zero. You know, it's the idea of the limit in calculus. So again, this is something that's very important to uh, calculus, the thing that every engineer probably knows and builds with it. Um, and last but not least is finance, its presence in finance. Um, you wouldn't have had the, the idea of interest decimal, and you wouldn't have had, therefore, the, uh, the way that would fund these science projects. Commerce. And, yeah, yeah, commerce, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, um, so without that, we wouldn't have had these at least important things. Um, yeah. So I was going to say, who was it invented in India or discovered yeah. in, uh, in, in uh, India? So the, the Babylonians, uh, the billion, um, um, of, I think it's modern day Iraq, I don't know how to pronounce it actually, but, uh, but yeah, they were the first to use it as a digit. Yeah. Uh, but then, yeah, the Indians imported and the Arabs used it. And yeah. then later on, uh, Europe uh, uh, approved of it. Uh, it's interesting to note that, uh, you know, Aristotle, um, uh, so Aristotle accepted infinity. It's, he's okay with infinity, but he couldn't accept uh, zero. Um, so, yeah, the concept of accepting nothingness was just absurd. And uh, I think that carries to a very interesting point, because we take a lot of these um, uh, numbers for granted. So, uh, the zeros, the negatives, these were t the, now we take them for granted. But when they first came, there was this debate, or sh should we include them, shouldn't we? And um, I... I, I um, yeah, uh, there are a lot of paradoxes that I don't think I'm, I, I, I am uh, out of what I planned on speaking about. But uh, again, it's very, very interesting. The book for Charge Safe is actually so interesting. And um, it's, again, it, we're, we're very lucky that we have these things and that we definitely take them for granted. And uh, they weren't never this way before. Mm. Any, any comments on the, the, the number zero from you two? Well, I'd like to say... Uh, yeah, I'd like to say, I mean, in our um, profession, what we're doing in basically in space and science and technology, as you said, without the number zero, just looking at the aspect of binary, when you're programming and, you know, trying to look at the electronics, software engineering, without that, there would be no, you know, like you say, zeros and ones and binaries, and then you wouldn't be able to kind of foresee where we are today in any kind of, Electro, uh, ele whether it's electronics, whether it's software engineering, or that type of uh, field uh, without that number. So that's what I'd add, basically. We're going to talk about nuclear power and, and the nuclear bomb later. Um, and, but with that, the idea was in the air, wasn't it, Over in the, from, from the beginning, or really from the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and then, you know, Einstein developed mm -hmm. his ideas. Um, and it led kind of inevitably to the idea of, of nuclear fission. Um, but I wonder if there was similar ideas about this mystery of, of zero in the air at that time than it took it, it, before it was discovered, or was it, you know, it wasn't a solitary genius who suddenly said, oh, there is a zero, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call nothing zero, and that's where we start counting. I mean, if it didn't arise then, would, have it, would it have been discovered later? Uh, that's very interesting, I think. Um, well, I think we, we had to do it out of mathematical necessity. Um, so um, uh, it's interesting to note also the story of uh, imaginary numbers. Um, um, because I think there is some similarity, because you know you come up with these inventions um, as, as, as something that comes by your way while you're doing a solution. For example, um, it always was a problem and a challenge for doing what are called cubic equations in, in algebra. Uh, there was hardships at solving these equations. We could deal to some extent with the quadratic. We still had some problems because, like, not all quadratics, I think. Uh, but then uh, there was this mathematician called Cardano who was able to reach a solution to it. And you had to come up with imaginary numbers just for the time so that you can solve the equation, and that's it. That's right. how we deal. For those of us who are mere biologists or yeah. you know, not mathematical, uh -huh. remind us what an imaginary number is. Uh, yeah, well, basically it's the square root of a negative number. So, for example, the square root of negative one, that's, again, something that's... It's imaginary because it doesn't exist. Excuse me? 
it, it, it's ima we have to imagine it yes, because it exactly. doesn't exist. Yeah, it, it's, it's interesting because um, I'll, I'll, I'll delve into it later on. Um, but yes, OK, so, so he had to come up with a solution and became like a transitory step to finding a mathematical solution. And throughout time, it has always been something that's like, you know, we don't want to really deal with it because it's, again, it's a contradiction, it's a paradox. How can you have um, negative one times one is equals to negative one, uh, but you can't have like a uh, um, negative that's basically squared and it gives a negative answer. So there, again, there was a problem with negative two. So, uh, but what came out to be very interesting was in Schrodinger's equation, you could um, find these uh, imaginary numbers and they could actually predict reality. So what happened is uh, the, imagine, the term imaginary number is actually a misnomer. They're not really imaginary. They're not something out of pure invention. They're just a different dimension. It's just like you have the number line and then you have zero and then you have the negative numbers. So you could see imaginary numbers coming by doing uh, two minus three. You could see there's an imaginary number like, but yeah there is a presence on the number line. And even imaginary number, like when you look at you know, x squared minus 1, um, you'd think it should intersect with the value of something that's equal to 0. But you see it on, on, on a different side of the plane. What I'm basically trying to say is that it's a misnomer. Like We had the term imaginary number. They're not really imaginary. They, they are on the number line, just different. Uh, dimension. Okay, um, and so it, it basically opened up an entire new realm of of exploration, mathematical exploration. Um, let's let's move on, Salem. So we've been talking about r how zero was effectively set the building blocks for um, a whole new kind of mathematics and engineering, computing, and and, and let's talk about space. So. Where, where do you want to start with um, inventions in, this, in the space age? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, looking at our topic today, inventions that change the world, and, and, and I think, you know, something that really fascinates me, and I think when you look at, in the history of, or at least recorded uh, human history, uh, all cultures are always looking at the stars. They're always looking at the planets. Some believe, you know, the, the moon and the sun, etc., were gods. So there's always this connection with space, connection with the sky, connection of, you know, What's out there? Is there something bigger than us? So even today when I go to the expo, every pavilion has something linked with space, and each one of them links it to their history. So if you go to Australia, you'll see what the Aborigines did, etc. Mm. So um, I see every culture throughout history has something linked with the stars and the planets. So, but it's, what, what's fascinating for me is that throughout that recorded history or throughout that human history, um, obviously there was no flight and there was no... Uh, there was no actual ability to get into space or to get into, uh, into the air. Uh, so what fascinates me is if you look at from the first flight, which was, uh, you'd say, in, in the early uh, 20th century, so 1903, 1904, with the Wright brothers, and going from there until when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon, the, distance or the, the difference or the, the, the amount of years is 60, 65 years, 66 years. So if you look at... In, in, in 65 years, we as humans uh, took our first ever flight, and then 66 years later, we landed on the moon. So that, that, that fascinates me. I mean, that boggles the mind, if you think about it, that in thousands of years, we didn't achieve that objective. And then in such a short space of time, once we were able to basically go, you know, get up that curve, and as you say, you know, obviously, you're always, um, you know, there's always exponential growth in terms of technology, so you see that big growth. So if I talk about space or aerospace, what are the most important inventions? I think obviously that first flight is a key factor to, that really boomed, you know, whatever happened later on in terms of aerospace, in terms of uh, human space flight, and in terms of us every day getting on a plane and, you know, traveling across the globe. And then I think there were milestones there. So obviously the first uh, satellite Sputnik that was launched, that was also something unique that, you know, can we actually do that? Can we actually put an object into Earth's orbit? And that object will continuously orbit and then we can communicate with it and benefit from it. Before that, nobody, it was all theories. You know, we could potentially do that, but we never actually did it. And then obviously a next milestone was the launch of uh, Yuri Gagarin, of course, uh, you know, we had uh, Laika and we had uh, Ham, the, the, uh, the, the, the monkey or the chimpanzee, I think. Uh, yeah. You know, so, but before that, 
can humans or can living things survive in space? What would happen to them? That was, the thinking was, you know, if you go into space, are you going to be able to, are you going to explode? Are you going to come back safely? You know, what's going to happen to you? So uh, obviously getting a human in space and then orbiting, that was a key moment. And, you know, it seems something very simple when you look at Yuri Gagarin's flight. He went up, took an orbit or two, and then came down. The same with the US, they had a suborbital flight, 15 minutes. So very short flights. Today you've got people going into space for years, or at least a year, and spending a long duration and living and working in space, and it's a different uh, concept. So I think those were key moments, and of course, I think for me personally, one of the, the biggest, I won't call it invention, but something that changed the world was landing on the surface of the moon. I think that's something that uh, all cultures, as I said earlier, were dreaming of that. We're thinking of that, you know, it was something that you could see very clearly. When are we going to be able to land on our closest neighbor, uh, celestial body, the moon? And obviously that happened in 1969, and I don't think the space world has looked back since then. So a lot of people might think as well that, you know, we haven't gone back to the moon. What have we done since then? Yeah. Yes, we haven't done maybe collectively something as amazing as that, but as a single event. But if you look at, you know, the space station, the, the ISS, if you look at all of the things that are happening in human spaceflight and how many people have gone into space and um, what's happened since then, that is something uh, quite unique, I think. Uh, it, it reminds me of um, a quote from Gene Cernan, who was the last man to walk on the moon in 1972, so 50 years ago this year since someone's been on the moon. And he said um, that it was, it was as if John F. Kennedy had reached far into the future uh, far into the 21st century and grabbed a decade and dragged it back into the 60s. Um, because, and, and effectively, that's what happened. You know, yeah. 1972 came and the space race stopped. Um, and, and as you say, we haven't been back. But things are really changing, aren't they? Um, I mean, you of all people know that. Um, so what's driving it now? We, you mentioned Sputnik. That, that really sparked the space race because the Americans saw that and were like, we cannot lose this, you know, we cannot let the Soviets win this thing, you know. Um, what's driving all the activity in space now? Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously, a little bit of the history is, you know, when uh, Sputnik was launched, uh, you know, the Americans were shocked, they were scared. Yeah. You know, sometimes they were saying things like, you know, how did the Soviets do this when, you know, they don't have washing machines or they don't have running water, etc. And they, they were, they couldn't believe it. I mean, they, they, you know, been kind of one-upped by the uh, Soviet Union. So, they obviously then started investing. And of course, then when Yuri Gagarin went up, that was the same thing, and you got into the space race. And of yeah. course, to get a man on the moon cost them about 200 billion US dollars. Um, and at some point, it was 5% of the US economy, you know, be dedicated to putting a man on the moon. And so a lot of people say, why aren't we going back? You know, uh, one aspect was that the architecture that was developed in the 60s was, you know, obviously use everything. You know, now it's all about reusable, but build everything with billions of dollars send two or three men to the moon and then come back and then throw all that away. So <laughs> that's why, you know, uh, the architecture has to change. But um, going back to your question, I mean, what's driving it now, I can also relate to the UAE. So today, obviously, what's driving it is useful applications and benefit for every single person on the planet today. So uh, I can guarantee you that there's not a single person, most probably every part of it, uh, uh, at some point in his day, he will be using some type of space technology or something derived from space technology. Whether it's navigation, whether it's telecommunications, whether it's satellite imagery, whether it's technologies that were developed for space, filtration systems, water filtration, whatever it may be, that have now come down and are used on the ground. So definitely uh, space is a big driver and a big push, the same way that the military can be as well, to develop new types of technology. So big budgets will come in, develop things that we traditionally might not develop, and then they spin off and spin back to usage for us on the ground. But obviously the applications are key, using navigation, communication, and satellite imagery. And I, I haven't spoken as well about the science. So if you're talking about you know, going to Mars, going to the moon, uh, going to the different planets, looking at the telescope like James Webb that was just uh, uh, launched, that was uh, about a $10 billion telescope. I think it was 30 years in the making. Yeah. But what that is gonna show us eventually is gonna be something that we, you know, we, we, don't have, we never had access to that type of information. So from a science perspective and learning where we came from, where our planet has developed, that I think is uh, invaluable, whatever you spend. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I couldn't agree more. And, um, you know, 
for the, the amount that it costs, actually, um, it's not that much to do some, some of the stuff that I think people are doing now and countries are doing. And, and in fact, individuals are doing now, yeah. you know, are able to, to do things that in the past it took an entire country to pivot towards a space program. And, and, and now it's, it's spread out much more. It's, it's, it's a really exciting time. Um, should we talk about Mars a little bit? Sure. Because this is really interesting, isn't it? Like, obviously, no one, no human's been to Mars yet. We've had a, f a few missions j just recently, really, started to become, um, starting to go there, starting to learn a bit more about it. Um, tell us about UAE's um, desire and, and, and involvement in the Mars program. Yeah, I'll, I'll explain a little bit about the, the global context, if you yeah. don't mind, and then we can see where the UAE kind of fits yeah. in there. So uh, what you see globally is, as, as we just spoke about, the Apollo missions, that was 50 years ago. Today, there's a big global push. It's called the Global Exploration Roadmap. And there's, as part of that, you have uh, um, a new mission called Artemis, basically, which is uh, uh, going back to the moon. Um, it's, it's a US-led um, uh, objective, which is putting the first uh, uh, the next American and the first woman on the surface of the moon, and of course going there in a sustainable manner. It's, it's an American-led initiative, but it's, it's global as well. Yeah. So that global exploration roadmap is saying, let's try everything on the moon, because it's closer, it's relatively easier to do it, uh, relatively at the yeah. end of the day, and, and it's relatively cheaper as well. Mm. And then let's use those technologies and whatever we learn to do that on Mars, but also let's use the moon as a springboard, so hopefully we have space stations and we have uh, uh, you know, a colony or something uh, on the surface of the moon where you can then act as a springboard to get to, towards Mars. So it would be cheaper to go to Mars that way. So uh, that's what's happening on a global scale. So if you look at the timeline today, going back to Artemis, it's by the mid-2030s is when that should be achieved, hopefully by the, uh, probably the end of the 2030s. And then from there it goes into Mars. Now the UAE comes in line is that we're looking at the same exact steps. Yes, we've sent a mission to Mars, which is an orbiter, which is studying the atmosphere of Mars, so that's a science mission, but also understanding how the atmosphere of Mars works on a planet scale, how the weather patterns work, that also helps for eventual understanding of the planet, which then helps you obviously land and hopefully eventually have people on the planet. But we're also uh, this year sending a rover to the surface of the moon, and that is as part of, we say, that global exploration roadmap. So we're trying to look at uh, uh, certain things with our rover, so uh, looking at different uh, uh, materials, how they stick uh, to the uh, lunar regolith. So one issue that astronauts had was that the lunar dust sticks to them. Yeah. And then obviously when you come into uh, your spacecraft and you know obviously uh, you take off your your suit, that lunar dust can then go because everything's floating. That can go into your lung system. It can affect you in a negative way. So we're trying to now see how different materials stick to the lunar. Uh, the, the, the lunar dust sticks to different materials. So just that's a small example of how that plays, uh, uh, it's a small objective that plays into the bigger objective of getting humans back to the moon. So this is where the UAE is playing a role. So we're going to the moon on our own, but we're going jointly as well. We have uh, three payloads from the French Space Agency. We have a payload on our, on our rover from NASA. So this is a glo it's, a, it's an international mission. And the same applies to our future missions for Mars as well. Hope that answers your question. Fantastic. Well, uh, again, we'll, we'll come back to this a bit later on. Um, Sir Hay, your turn. The, uh, the, the biggest invention that changed the world. Yeah, uh, well, uh, I, I was going to talk about uh, splitting the atom, and I'm certainly going to do that, but in the process of this discussion, I started to doubt my assumption that that was the biggest invention about, about zero. Mm. Of course, that for me as a historian very important because that changed the way how we imagined the past and, and, and really made past open-ended and history open-ended. So it's, it's a dramatic, dramatic change in the, in the perspective. Um, uh, speaking about nuclear, it's, it's like with space, the, the biggest progress is made in the 20th century. At the beginning of the 20th century, Still, there is the assumption that atom is the, the most basic element that exists in, in the structure of the Earth, the uh, most basic element of any chemical structure. And uh, um, less than 50 years later, uh, you get an atomic bomb, and which wipes out entire cities. 
and one of the most maybe idealistic scientists of the 20th century, Robert Oppenheimer, uh, says, I became death. Uh, I, I became destroyer of worlds, uh, citing, uh, citing the Hindu, Hindu scripture. So how did it happen? And uh, the, the, the split in the atom uh, for me is very important in general thinking about that, thinking in general about the science and the responsibility that comes with the discoveries. Uh, because uh, the humankind discovered something that uh, by the year 1954, uh, and a little bit later, by early 1960s, the two superpowers in the world, the United States and the Soviet Union, had enough bombs already to destroy the entire planet. A little bit more than 50 years since the idea that, okay, the, 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 the atom is there to stay forever, we'll never split it, to discovering this enormous power in the uh, element that we can't even see but the, the, the power that can destroy everything around us. Um, it, it, there, there was an irony to a degree uh, that uh, the, the, this different possibilities of what the uh, releasing this energy of atom can, can mean or could mean were already laid out by a, um, by a writer, not by a scientist, H.G. Uh, Wells in uh, 1914, a few months before the start of, the, uh, of World War I, he published a book, the, uh, it seems to me the title was the world, uh, the world Set Free, where he envisioned this coming of the atomic age, where your cattle would be uh, uh, using uh, nuclear power, yeah. and, and the cars would be driven with the help of, of, of nuclear. Uh, but also he envisioned the war that would happen in, not in 1914, but in 1950s. Nuclear war. And he was trying to find a silver lining in all of that, saying that once the countries of the world realized how bad it was, that it, it can destroy the entire, the entire universe, then they all came together and created this global government. And that, that was the end of history of sorts. So the, the, the end of history of, of people fighting each other. So the bomb was there, the nuclear war didn't happen, thank God, and, and also the, the, the world is still divided today the way how, how it, 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 it was divided in the past. So we, we see this replay of history, which again raises the question not about nuclear only, but also about many other discoveries that we have about whether we, uh, as a humankind, have the right skills to, to be so successful, to manage the, the results of these discoveries and not to destroy ourselves. So I, 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 certainly, I certainly believe that we can, I hope that we can, but I also know that uh, it doesn't come easy. Because many scientists um, petitioned the US government not to go ahead and develop uh, the bomb and, and to, to stop the Manhattan Project, didn't they? Um, was Oppenheimer one of them that even signed it? Oppenheimer was one of them. Another was Leah Schiller, uh, the guy who in 1932 uh, uh, got a patent on nuclear fission. Before the nuclear fission was there, but he knew it was coming, so he patented the idea. Wow. <laughs> and he, he, went, he went then to, uh, to um, uh, Einstein and convinced him to sign a letter to President Roosevelt that something has to be done to, to build the bomb as soon as possible. Yeah. And all of them, they were scared that the Germans, actually, the Nazi Germany was ahead. That, that was the real powerhouse in the world. Not the United States, not, not any, any other. Germany at, at that time was, was the, 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 in that particular area powerhouse. And uh, they... they mm, lost sleep, they, they were building the bomb, they, they put uh, a lot of money into that. But once they realized that the Germans actually took the wrong turn, that they were not getting the bomb, Schillard was the one who already in 1943, 1944 was campaigning just to stop the project and, and not, not, not to have mm. the bomb. 
uh, Oppenheimer continued. He, he delivered the bomb, but then he said no to the, to the idea of building the hydrogen bomb because the, the bomb that can destroy the planet is the hydrogen bomb. Schiller went to, um, to um, Einstein to convince him. Um, in, in 1939, it was, it seems to me, August 1939, and he couldn't drive. So the guy who drove him was, uh, was the uh, um, guy who then built, built the hydrogen bomb. So, uh, the, the, so within, within that group, one of the scientists took one, one uh, turn and another, another. So, yes, but uh, crossing the border going into the Soviet Union, uh, the father of the Soviet hydrogen bomb, Andrei Sakharov, then becomes a dissident, one of the leading dissidents. Uh, to a degree, a parallel with, uh, with, with Oppenheimer. So those people really were terrified on a certain level but by what they did. They did that out of patriotism for their country, believing that if they don't have, the other guys would have advantage or destroy them. But once they realized them, they were also the first ones to say, okay, we have to, we have to roll things back. We, 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 they didn't trust politicians to to have that, that instrument, to have that weapon. So, you know, thankfully, they've only been used twice um, and never again since then. Um, so there's been this uneasy, sort of mutually assured destruction um, philosophy going on, um, and, and, and no one, you know, no one's done anything since. Um, so let's just put that to the side, nuclear weapons, for the moment, because during that time, then we've had the rise of nuclear power, or the rise and fall, and the rise and fall and rise of nuclear power, um, and, and, and very recently, even nuclear fusion um, is starting to get more exciting. So, uh, what, do you want to, what do you want to say about nuclear power? Um, maybe something about fission and fusion? Uh, well, nuclear power is, uh, again, that's, that's where the big hope was, that it would change the world. And uh, we got uh, submarines and, and we got, uh, we got uh, ships that are being powered by nuclear. But other than that, it was a big disappointment uh, in a sense that uh, today we have 10% of electricity produced by, by uh, nuclear. A lot, but 10%, this is not exactly the, the, yeah. game, the game changer. And uh, the, 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 reasons, the reasons for that are numerous, but one of them is that nuclear power was never really, and is not even today, a fully independent field of, of uh, either, either economy or science or engineering fully independent from the bomb. It was an afterthought. In 1954, President Eisenhower goes to the United Nations and delivers his uh, Atoms for Peace speech. Why he is doing that to calm the nerves of the world that the Americans are not going to blow, blow up the world and to convince the American taxpayers who bankrolling all this, all this research that atoms are there also to do some good things. No one would touch nuclear energy because think about Chernobyl, Fukushima, about liabilities. There are billions of dollars that now in Japan that they don't know what to do, where, where that money to take from in terms of liabilities. So the US government goes there, invests money, gives, gives guarantees, so if the government is not there, nuclear power econ uh, economically and in this legal framework that we have today is, 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 uh, couldn't survive. But that's, that, 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 that's a story, that, that's the beginning. The problem is not the beginning per se, the problem is that there has never been a full separation because the nuclear power today, all the reactors that we have, they are uh, mm, some modifications of the nuclear reactors that were built for military purposes. Mm. Either it's Chernobyl reactor that was dual purpose reactor that was built originally to produce weapon, uh, weapon grade plutonium and then just uh, turned into a kettle. 
or, or it's the, the water water reactors that were built actually to uh, small reactors to power nuclear submarines and then were turned into again kettles. And it's only now that we have the first what 60, 70, I don't know how many years after after the first after the first nuclear power plants that we have specifically people working on the designing reactors for the, not for the war, but for the peace. Yeah. And uh, again, I, I really hopeful that they come up with, with something really cool and interesting. I also know that no new technology enters into the world without a trial period, which means accidents. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just, it, 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 it's a, it's, yeah. it's, it's a, it's a um, simple engine or, 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 or it's a reactor or it's yeah. But isn't anything. it funny how, um, I mean, we are getting new designs for nuclear reactors, modular nuclear reactors, which are much easier to build than the massive ones that we have at the moment um, and much safer probably or possibly. We hope. I think so. But the, but the point is, um, isn't it funny how people are often so scared of nuclear power when they're not scared or only recently have started becoming scared of, of fossil fuels and the damage they cause. Because if you totted up the amount of damage we've suffered from nuclear power accidents and the amount of damage we've suffered from fossil fuels, you know, there's no comparison. Yes, but we are humans, right? Yeah. And, and we, we, we believe in things that we see. We believe in other things as well, but those are the most, the most convincing ones. And if for the first time you hear about nuclear when two cities actually evaporated, hmm. that's quite an entrance, yeah. right? Uh, if you, if you uh, uh, go to Chernobyl nuclear um, area today and see this ghost city, the, the kind of a nuclear Pompeii, the city of Pripyat, that, 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 stays, that, 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 that stays with you. And uh, another thing is its invisible enemy, the so-called invisible enemy. Yeah. It's, it's, like, it's like COVID, right? Again, now we are a little bit more cavalier about COVID, but think about how we started. You don't know where it is, what to do, okay? You wash your hands, but then w w what do you do with your jacket when you walked in? And, and then th there are jackets of other members of your family, and then there are children there. You don't know. Radiation is, is exactly the same thing. Yeah. It, it is a very scary thing. And uh, uh, that's, 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 I would say, the, 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 the main reason. I'm, um, in, in May, there will be my book released, which is called Atoms and Ashes, from uh, um, Bikini Atoll to Fukushima, where I look at six largest, biggest disasters, nuclear disasters, starting from this uh, test of the, nuclear, of the hydrogen bomb that went wrong and ending with Fukushima, Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, in, in the middle, wind scale fire. And uh, what I'm trying actually to, to um, understand is th there is an agreement that accidents is the main reason of why the people are so scared of nuclear. And I'm trying to answer the question of, okay, the, the, the technology improves, but in terms of our culture, safety culture, generally culture in general, the, the, the way how we think, how we, we treat, how our bureaucracies are organized, whether the causes of those accidents are still with us or not. And uh, again, I, I'll not disclose my, my conclusion but that's, that's, that's what I'm looking, uh, uh, looking at. And again, accidents are extremely important part of this, of this deep concern and distrust. And nuclear accidents, local in terms of the causes, but even if radiation doesn't cross the borders, they become global, like look at Chernobyl and Fukushima, and then Germans decide to go nuclear free, yeah. right? Uh, and, and, and this is just one of those examples where people can react to the accident. Uh, th th there was a saying born at that time, Chernobyl uh, somewhere is Chernobyl everywhere. So the, the, the idea of the nuclear accident. Um, I'm going to say what I think the, the most important thing is, um, just because uh, you know we've had loads of interesting things, but we haven't had any biology. Um, uh, and I was an evolutionary biologist, so it's no surprise 
I'm going to pick um, Darwin's discovery of natural selection, um, which gave us uh, an explanation for all life on Earth, which we simply didn't have before. And it's an incredibly deep and rich um, theory. Um, and I'm just going to sneak another one in as, as a more specific discovery, which I think is worth, I'm not going to say it's the most important, but it changed the world for sure, uh, and that's the structure of DNA um, and, and the genetic revolution that started then and that we're still seeing the consequences of rippling through the, the world. And, 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 you know, to understand first how life evolved on Earth and then how life is built with the genetic code and then to be able to, to, to play around with it, um, and it's a digital code, mm -hmm. you know, we know how to, to muck around with it and rewrite it. Um, that, the, the consequences of that, uh, of being able to change life to our own desires, um, we're, we're starting to see, and I think that the, that will have some uh, amazing impacts. Um, already, already it is, but in the future. I mean, if we go to Mars, we're going to need to modify all the organisms and probably the humans that go up there to survive the radiation, right? And to grow things uh, on the moon or on the Mars, or on space stations. So, you know, that, that's just one thing that springs to mind. We should do testing in Pripyat. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the way to do it, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, has anyone got anything you, you want to add to what we've been talking about so far? But we're going to go to questions soon. But um, before I do that, is there anyone, any, anything has occurred to you guys as we've been chatting? I had one thing. I, I think, you know, just to add on what you said about uh, nuclear energy and fossil fuels, like you said, you know, yeah. if we look at it, probably fossil fuels and our burning of fossil fuels have, you know, uh, been more dangerous to humanity. But with nuclear accidents, like you said, they're very visual. And I'd say the same, in my opinion, of people who are scared of flying. Uh, but when you say, if you get in your car, they say a car is much more dangerous yeah. than flying. Mm -hmm. But when a plane accident occurs, you've got a much larger amount of people uh, you know, passing away, and it's very visual. So I think that's probably an analogy I wanted to use with the nuclear power. I, I certainly agree. I certainly agree. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. a problem of, of human psychology that we're stuck with. Mm. Yeah. If I, you asked about fusion, yeah, if I can maybe mm -hmm. a couple, uh, couple words. Because, uh, again, recently we had this major um, announcement that the, 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 the scholars were able to keep fusion reaction going for five seconds, which is a big thing because yeah. the, the principle matters. Now they can believe they can go for five minutes and, and, and for five hours and so on and so forth. And, uh, f either fission or fusion in nuclear energy is a big, of course, now factor in these debates about the uh, climate change. Uh, so again, th there is a new factor in favor of the of the nuclear of the nuclear physics uh, mm. that that enters enters the scene, enters the debate. The the the, the question is when and and how safe it might be. Yeah. And with fusion, again, the most uh, optimistic. Uh, uh, prognosis is what mid of the century right the the, the first mm. the, 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 the first cattle the first machine that they yeah. can uh, 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 the build of that sort so but again that's that's in terms of the of the uh, future of the of the nuclear uh, that is an important horizon yeah um, yeah but maybe we should say that um, nuclear fission is splitting the atom and that releases a lot of energy but nuclear fusion is, is the kind of the opposite, fusing two hydrogen atoms together and making helium. And when you do that, it takes a huge amount of energy to put them together, but it releases even more energy. Um, and so the idea is if you can create the conditions to get that happening, to get fusion happening, um, you can get an incredible amount of energy out. But uh, yeah, it's been an unbelievably long time to develop it. Uh, uh, and, and, and as you say, we, it's very promising, but it's not going to solve the climate crisis because it's not going to happen in time. Uh, we need to do something else before then. The, the temperature that you need to make that fusion is 10 times higher than the temperature at the core, at the center of the sun. Yeah. And we have to do that on Earth. Mm -hmm. Contain that 
contain something that hot in a container on Earth somehow. And that, you know, that's just one of the problems that there is. Um, okay, great. Let, let's, um, let's take some questions from the audience. Can um, anyone have a question? Yep. What's an invention that we need or one that cu currently exists in its present state that needs honing to solve a problem that we either have now or certainly will have in the near future? That's a good question. Um, well, I'll, I, I can say one off the top of my head would be um, a direct air capture of carbon dioxide at, at, at scale, uh, cheap, cheaply and at huge scale to get carbon dioxide out, out of the atmosphere. I mean, I still think it's better to plant trees and get them to get it out of the atmosphere, but uh, we're always going to need technology to get carbon dioxide out um, of the atmosphere and away when we're generating it in processes that we can't decarbonize, like in concrete and steel production. So that, that, that's my one off the top of the head, uh, making that at scale and cheaply. Um, I honestly, I don't have anything in mind. I think, um, well, yeah, reflecting back on mathematics and how um, it, it gave us this power of abstraction, and it wasn't, it wasn't something that we worked on. We did not like sign a team and uh, like you guys need to work on this and it will be great. Um, it just came out of it because we were, you know, exploring and trying to find patterns in the world and trying to make a representation of these patterns. So I'd really love if we can, like in the future, have more ideas that are this way, that are like paradigm shifting. They shift how we understand, how we treat the world. Um, Actually, when I was talked to about, you know, doing the panel, uh, I would say, I would have said, you know, that the most important uh, discovery or in invention we had was the scientific method, the methodology of um, dealing with evidence, the methodology of, uh, you know, making all these inventions. And again, this, is, this was ideas. Um, so sometimes you can have um, an idea, an interest in something, and that's all what you really need, uh, rather than, you know, the hard technical stuff that uh, we already know. Um, uh, and yeah, and that's the, you know, the, the constant fight between the exploitation and the exploration paradox and which one should we put energy. So I'd really have, if we can have something as eye-opening as the discovery of mathematics or, uh, you know, scientific method or even Darwin's theory, something that really shifts our understanding of how we can think about things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great Sorry. question. Yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, it's a difficult one as well. But uh, what I'd say from, uh, I would say two things. I think uh, definitely what we have you know, if we're talking about energy, I mean, uh, most energy sources that we use today produce something negative. So that's something that we need to be working on to obviously, as you say, improve it and make sure that we uh, get to uh, sources of energy that are not uh, basically producing um, aspects that will, d will destroy the planet. But from a space perspective, I'll go back to um, obviously my topic. I think, um, you know, everything in space, in my opinion, is is always looking at what we saw on Star Trek and what we saw on Star Wars. So getting space to that, you know, are you able to get, sit on this spaceship uh, in a chair, you know, where you've got your environment where you're not floating around and, you know, warp speed, <laughs> warp 10, Captain <laughs> Picard, make it so. That is something that I see that space technology, when it gets to that, I think then we've reached a very uh, pivotal point. So right now, space technology is very advanced, but it's not anywhere near what you see on... Uh, uh, on Star Wars or Star Trek. So I'd like to see that, I think. Uh, yeah, as a historian, I, I think we should invent time machine. Uh, but, uh, but to be more specific uh, and, and very, very concrete, what we badly need today, in my opinion, is a good battery. A good what? Battery. Huh. Yeah. Battery for uh, basically switching to renewables. Because our problem is that when there is a lot of sun, we can't then store energy. Or there is a lot of wind, we can't store energy. Yeah. If we solve the problem of the battery, we'll solve a lot of related to that issues uh, uh, dealing with, with climate. And it's, it's very, very specific and very difficult. 
I, I have actually an idea. Uh, also, I think if we manage to reinvent ourselves, so for example, yeah, there is global warming, there is a lot of carbon dioxide. If we manage to make ourselves, you know, rather, for example, than breathing oxygen, we breathe carbon dioxide, or that we you know <laughs> live better in a place, uh, or, you know, we all turn of into us, plants. Oh, yeah, exactly. We, or, we'll just or just staying plants. in the metaverse where there's no, yeah. like, uh, carbon problems or whatever. Yeah. So um, I'd be really looking forward to getting rid of my body. I think that's a, a huge cause of like diseases and stuff. And so if we can really in reinvent how, uh, how we function, how we live, I think that's uh, well, something that I would really wish. Turning ourselves into trees, right? Uh, yeah, well, yeah. that can be another solution. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I know you're joking, but we actually do need to reinvent yes. ourselves, yeah, the yeah. way we're consuming yes, yes. things. You know, it really needs to happen. Um, should we take some more questions? First of all, thank you for an absolutely eye-opening from a non-scientific person. It was incredibly um, from the zero to the space to the, the splitting the atom. So it was all great. But one of the inventions at my age that I think has changed the world, you know what it is? This thing? Phone. The mobile phone. Yeah. It's changed for me. I look at how it was when I was a child in the 50s to how any child in... 21st century, how they operate, what they do, what's happening in their brains. So for me, that invention has completely revolutionized so much of society, so much of what we do. So I'd like the panel's view on the greatest invention, and one of them being the mobile phone and all the things that go with it, the internet and so on. Yeah. I mean, you're the, the, you're the YouTube star. You're closest to that. That's <laughs> you must... I mean, it, it's revolutionized how we absorb information, right? Having it in, in our hand. I mean, you, you wouldn't have a job without a smartphone. Well, yes, definitely. I am, uh, I, yeah, I'm glad that the smartphones <laughs> exist and the internet. I'm uh, very lucky uh, that that's happening. And it's definitely causing a lot of change in the generations we're having. Um, and um, yeah, it's definitely very, very important. And I think uh, I would say uh, yeah, I'm definitely glad they exist. Uh, yeah, I mean, do you, do you feel, do you worry about kids being on their phones too much? Or do you think it's, oh, the, it's more good than bad overall? Well, uh, I, uh, uh, there's something uh, that I, I, I found really interesting uh, when reading about uh, you know, who first discovered writing. And uh, what, what was interesting, basically, that there was a huge debate about uh, whether writing is a good invention or not. So uh, <laughs> yeah. I imagine like the, the, the Greek people, you know, having their Twitter debates about, you know, <laughs> uh, should we adopt writing? Because I think it was Aristotle, I think also <laughs> who like uh, thought that this was a terrible idea because uh, people would lose their memory because, you know, they have this uh, way of keeping information that's just not uh, very, uh, helpful to um, how we use. But uh, again, I think uh, these things come and they make us focus on other things. They help us uh, to do um, uh, other things and to be much more efficient in other things. I don't really know much about how the science of it is, how dangerous it is, what kind of diseases does it bring. Uh, but definitely overall to society, I think um, we've always been having these kind of inventions yeah, that yeah. makes us stop using things and use things and you know shift our energy levels towards some part or another. Um, and uh, yeah, I That's a great would point. like to see how yeah. things uh, go about. Yeah, so. I, I definitely agree. And I think uh, it's a very good one, uh, Isabel, because the mobile phone, even in my generation, in my lifetime, the last, you know, let's say 20 years, it has changed the way that we live at the end of the day. So, I mean, I remember when we had those, uh, we used to call them bleep, you know, the, uh, where you know, it would be bleeping and uh, you'd go somewhere and you'd, you'd have a phone card and co or try and find a phone. Uh, th that was the way that we would live. You know, if I want to communicate with my, if my mom wants to know where I am, she's going to bleep me and then I'll go and find a phone if I want to tell her where I am. But yeah, yeah. now, you know, <laughs> she can track me with the mobile phone. So yeah. it has changed the way our lives are and the way we get information. I used to get Premier League results uh, two days later, and I, uh, there was some system that you'd find a way that maybe 10 hours after the results, you'd, you'd be able to get them here in, in Dubai. That was how life and now was. Now you can see Mo Salah <laughs> scoring in almost real time. Yeah. Well, in real time, you know. And you can probably interact with that as well somehow <laughs> and, you know, do it on Twitter and have... So I think it's, it's definitely changed the way we live. Uh, for, the, for good or, or bad, it's changed the way we live for sure. Okay. Sahi, are you uh, addicted to your phone? 
Uh, well, uh, I, I'm, I'm addicted and I'm trying to fight that addiction. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm losing the battle. But yeah, that's, that's, that, that was a really, in, in terms of our life, Time that that was probably the, the biggest, the biggest, the most profound change. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have pretty much run out of time. Um, if anyone's got a burning question, we could probably fit it in. Um, but look, otherwise, um, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> let's let's wrap things up. So look, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for those at home watching, um, and thanks to the AV team, all the volunteers that have, have helped put this together and the translators, um, our sponsor, Emirates Airline, the founding partner, Dubai Culture, the parent organization, Emirates Literature Foundation, uh, the session sponsors today, Dubai Tourism and Diwa, uh, and the day sponsor, Dubai Duty Free. Um, and of course, our fantastic speakers, Ahmed Salem and Sohi. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, thanks for, for having us. Let's give, us a, give them a round of applause. Thanks, guys. That's fantastic chat. Thanks very much.